Hey, Shadowfax. How's it going? I'm just playing with the settings a little bit. Um, as usual, when I start, I need to spend a little bit of time and try to get the image quality the way that I want it. <clears throat> hey Uriel, how's it going? Here's somebody trying to get into my lab. I think they're going into the other room. You're just waking up. I'm also just waking up the ICM. Um, I think this is a Little Thalassia Syra. Uh, I'm looking at some material. Oh, maybe it's a Cusana discus. Looking at some material from San Francisco Bay. Um, this is some material that Pacific Plankton sent me. And I have some samples from June Lake on here as well from the last time that I streamed. And uh, I didn't sort of uh, completely look through all of those because I was busy sort of running an interview at the same time, and, um, and then we had sort of a short stream, so probably go back and look at some of those um, once I check out what we have here. These samples are um, the live material, the material that was collected um, from the plankton net uh, that's been rinsed, but hasn't really been digested in the way that we usually do. So it doesn't have the um, uh, the normal nitric acid. Um, for planet Al, uh, do I ever study mushrooms or spores? Um, I don't study them for my research, but do we put them on the SEM? Yeah. Uh, in fact, we did that, uh, I think, probably four streams ago or something. Um, and then many, many times in the past. Um, so you can either go through the VODs or I'm sure sometime in the future we'll take another look at um, mushrooms and spores. Um, it's definitely something that we regularly um, put on the SEM just to sort of uh, see what we can see. Um, Usually it's kind of opportunistic whenever I find a mushroom and uh, I'm running low on diatom stuff to look at. Um, I will uh, look at some other things, sometimes pollen, sometimes mushrooms, um, phytolis. Um, we've looked at basically everything you can think of, uh, <laughs> bugs, um, uh, water bears, other water organisms, um, so just whatever we we feel like. Sometimes, um, a lot of times, I focus on diatoms because that's my specialization. Also, hello, Anna. How are you doing? Um, and duck, 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 duck goose. Uh, it's San Francisco Bay samples. So, and then I also have some stuff from June Lake that uh, Studio sent me that we had on the last stream, but uh, I didn't spend enough time sort of looking through the sedimentary stuff. So I sort of felt like there's a lot there and I could have um, spent a bit more time looking through it. So I think these were collected in, um, in early October. I think this is October 8 um, is, the, is the day that they were collected. I think there was another 
one in here that was collected on the 12th or something like that. So basically second week of October. And um, we looked through some of the processed material, but I was actually trying to see if we can find any um, anything interesting in this sort of unprocessed material. All we did was uh, rinse it a lot. So um, by that I mean we shake it up and then let it settle for a little time, um, typically just uh, maybe five minutes or so, and then uh, use a uh, sink aspirator to pull off all of the, the mud and organic matter. And um, uh, the result is that it clarifies the water, gets rid of a lot of the very small particles, and it also gets rid of the salts. Um, because these are coming from San Francisco Bay. That's uh, a brackish slash saltwater environment. And, um, and so these basically just have the most simple type of processing just to get rid of uh, the salts. And, um, and then aside from that, uh, we don't really do much to them. Uh, let them dry on a cover slip and stick them in the scanning electron microscope after sputter coating them. So this is a uh, Cerarella. And um, I think I looked it up. I think this is Gemma, maybe something close to Gemma. I just kind of like was glancing through um, these types of uh, cerarellas that we see in the marine realm. Um, and, well, and that was one that, uh, just from memory, I wasn't doing um, stride density measurements or any sort of technical uh, analysis of them. I just sort of wanted to see what we were looking at. something. It's another one of those. I think you said this was Ray Finis. Is that right? Let's see, they have a little apical pore field on one end. see just a little bit of clay on the samples, um, organic matter probably, rather than actual clay uh, that didn't rinse off. It's a pretty one. Let's see if we can take a picture of it. Um, so I just rotated the stage around. It looks like maybe I went a little too far. just doing a little bit of uh, adjustment to the brightness and contrast settings. Um, when you change elevations in the SEM a lot, basically it uh, 
needs to have some adjustment to the brightness and contrast settings. <laughs> Maybe I could be a marine diatomist now. Um, if I learn something, um, then I learn it, basically. So whatever it is, uh, marine or freshwater. Um, I just need to see it a few times and then um, the problem is I don't know like for the benthic marine organisms or even some of the planktic marine organisms like what is the feature that determines which genus it goes into and um, I don't have any guidebooks to help me with that so uh, I think if I had that information, I could could be a marine diatomist. Um, I don't really think that the marine diatom community needs another marine diatomist, um, such that I need to abandon my freshwater post. But um, yeah, I suppose I could probably do it, just not uh, not very well right now. Uh, oh, I see you found uh, one of the follower emotes there, duck, 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 goose, and uh, as well, Anna. Those are nice, aren't they? So you can uh, uh, throw those out anytime you feel like it now, right? Um, that's kind of a neat uh, addition. And I think that's the whole collection of them right there. There's kind of a lot now. Um, and uh, I added some and changed some uh, last night when I added the follower emotes. I added these, uh, uh, a couple of new ones. And I mean, ones besides the follower emotes is new. So these ones, um, that's a uh, arachnidiscus, a diatom that I described, Stephanodiscus coruscus, and um, a uh, another Actinopticus. So um, that's kind of a neat feature. Um, I don't know why they don't make that available for everybody, but um, they still refer to it as a beta program. And I know that um, Pacific Plankton has also been added to the beta program. Something in here is not locked. I guess it's this. Yeah, okay. Um, so that's a... I've been waiting for them to add them to more people because I feel like why not have uh, something for followers to reward people for following other than just a message that pops up every time I stream. Um, I think you can only use them inside this channel, which is sort of a... I mean, it's kind of a weird way to do uh, emotes, but um, I guess it makes sense. Um, also, I should mention that uh, I did a stream a couple of weeks ago now um, where I talked about uh, how I colorize the images. So down below me is all these like really spectacular SEM images that I've um, added color to. Um, I got a lot of, uh, oh, it doesn't work on mobile. It works for us though. We can see what you did, uh, Shadow. So um, I created this sort of, uh, like people ask me a lot, like how do you colorize the images? So I went through and um, did a little sort of, I don't know, it's not really a tutorial, but I kind of walk through uh, what I do and um, and uh, how I go through the process of colorizing images. And 
Hang on, I'm trying to manage this. Uh, goes here. This is Refinice. External view. And um, so I went through the sort of process of how do I colorize images. And, um, and then for Funzy, I also made a, um, a coloring contest. So I think I have a command for it. Here it goes. Um, with a link to um, uh, there's a link in there to the video if you haven't seen it, um, or if you already know how to use like Photoshop or other tools to colorize images, um, you can just go ahead and colorize it. Um, the image that is in the coloring contest is in this link, and then um, as long as I get like three or four entrants, then we'll probably do um, uh, a contest, an actual decision-making contest, where I'll have the community here make some decisions as to which ones are the best. Um, if there's just a few, like uh, three or four, then I'll probably just have my daughter help me decide which one is the best. And um, I'm, of course, not uh, engaged in the actual coloring contest, but um, it's this image that uh, we collected from the June Lake stream. And um, it's available there. You can just download it from the page and then colorize it and then send me um, the image through Discord. And, um, and then you could win a $20 gift certificate to Redbubble. So you could buy something of your, whatever you'd like. Um, Christmas is coming, so maybe you'd like to pick out something nice. Um, or you could get something from uh, the merchandise that I have that's up there if you'd like, but you don't have to. Um, and then uh, that's some sort of like, you know, fun thing. And I'll probably do uh, new coloring contests like every month but we'll have different sort of uh, types of coloring contests. So this one is basically learning to colorize SEM images. And um, some of them you could actually color, you don't necessarily need to color it using uh, Photoshop or a tool like that. You could print it out and then color it in with, uh, you know, whatever you use to color stuff with. Um, watercolors, if you have the ability to print it onto paper that you could use watercolors, or you could use um, uh, markers or crayons, I don't care. Or you could use an SC, uh, you could use the uh, Photoshop or, or free tools like GIMP to colorize it. Uh, and then subject it to uh, my daughter determining which, which she thinks is the coolest. Uh, keep that in mind, it's going to be judged by a seven-year-old. Uh, and then some assistance from me. So, um, you know, it's important if you stay inside the lines if you're going to color with crayons, I suppose. Um, in any case, uh, if you're interested in, in checking that out, uh, the link is there. Um, you will probably have to register for Discord to see that link. Um, but then that'll give you a way to send me your finished product. Uh, this is Campley Discus, closely related to the Cirrella that we saw earlier. Um, this one's broken. A lot of them, for some reason, from this species that we see commonly in um, San Francisco Bay, appear broken. And uh, it must just be very fragile because I don't do anything rough when we process them that might uh, lead them to be particularly subjected to damage. So. These little tiny guys are kind of interesting. I was sort of hoping we would find some um, dinoflagellates or some of the other stuff uh, in this material. I suppose it's still possible. 
Um, I haven't seen any yet. Only seen diatoms and uh, silica flagellates. And I guess I saw a sponge spicule a little bit earlier. Um, but I haven't really seen a, um, a lot of the organic stuff. At least not in a complete state. Uh, this is a radiolarian. It's kind of buried under this diatom a bit, but um, that's an animal, not a plant or an algae. one's just at a slight angle. I was trying to figure out why it was oblong, but it's actually just tilted up, sitting on the curved uh, surface of the outer side of the valve. So it looks like it's um, oblong, but it's actually just a deception. totally sure what that is. It's huge, so it looks like maybe it's part of an isthmia. Maybe it partially dissolves so that the outer layer is missing. There's a lot of round things, uh, typical plankton sample. And this is a really cute little short rhizoselenia. The valve face and the other end are basically right here <laughs> together uh, with almost no girdle bands between them. Hey, Pacific. And hello, uh, 1F89. You think I might be rough with them? I'm not rough with them. If anything, Mallory is rough with them. <laughs> to get the dinoflagellates, you have to bring them in person. It seems like it. Uh, unless commonly you just show up. Did you see the new follower emotes, Pacific? I have them. I have them in here. Oop. We're looking at. Uh, why don't I take a picture of that rhizoselenia? Because it's. I don't know. It's kind of ugly. It's not up to my standards, whatever those are. Um, but I can do it if you'd like. Let's see, I need to rotate maybe 20 degrees. Let's see that my calculations are still pretty good. Um, let's see, maybe just a little farther.
you go. <clears throat> you asked for it and you got it. Can't use them on mobile. Seems that way. I don't know why, so usually the width is a sign of age, um, but the number of girdle bands, I think they can add girdle bands in their sort of living conditions, so this might actually be a pretty young one. I think that's the way I would interpret that, that they, um, or that they rather recently split from the, um, from the uh, the parent vowel, I think that's the way that I would I would say it. Um, I don't know how like I'm not familiar with like the I guess I haven't seen Rise of Selenia dividing. Yeah, it's a new clone. Hey, Calathon, how's it going? Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> They get pretty skinny out towards the ends. Hey, Commander Shafard, how you doing? Pacific got it. They do just kind of get smaller and smaller as they go out. You can kind of see where the... Um, oops, I think you can kind of see where the bow face starts. It's right around here looks like the girdle bands you can see like a little um like a uh a bit where the um the bowel gets wider right there or at least that's where the girdle bands start to lap onto it so i guess it's actually maybe this thing right here is the inside edge of the valve face and then the girdle bands start wrapping around it right about there. But it does look like it just keeps going. I guess I don't uh, take a lot of pictures of Rise of Selenia, so it's probably a good idea to at least get one. this so we can see stuff a little bit better. cool pattern on the valve face. This is a uh, glyphmodesmium. And these are sponge spicule parts here. Really sure what's going on in this little part of this diatom. Looks like a Thalassia Syra, but I don't know what this is. Oh, it's probably what's underneath it. We're probably seeing through the diatom actually. That's uh, when it's lightly silicified. It's like this junk is probably some junk behind it right there. There's a nice sponge spicule. Um, for some of the thinner diatoms, the electron beam goes all the way through and um, and then we get some information from what happens behind it as well so that one looks
eggs actually it looks like it belongs to a cerarella it's very egg shaped there's a little tiny um, silica flagellate it's filled with junk Just for contrast, all of those massive diatoms that we see are um, uh, marine diatoms. And this little guy right here is sort of a brackish, kind of a borderline freshwater diatom. This is Cyclotella littoralis. And um, you can see this is kind of a small one. They get bigger than this, but uh, this is sort of an older one. And its size is around 20 microns. And even the small little round guys that we have, like this one, this is Apelasis syra, um, a smaller one, is more than double that size. And some of these really large um, centric diatoms that we see in these samples are more than double the size of that one, right? So 80 to 100 microns easily. And um, there is in these samples sometimes some very large discus that are uh, upwards of like 200, 300 microns, something like that. This has a lot of uh, little filter portula on the valve face. another Actinopticus. Uh, Detilum. See a bunch of like um, the bigger ones in here. I haven't seen very many. Um, so this is a Peralia. I haven't seen a lot of um, Skeletonema recently. It seems like those maybe have finally started to taper off. Um, there's some sort of seasonality where we kind of see some things, they show up for a while, and then we don't see them for sometimes a very long time in between. Um, this diatom, Peralia, is a marine diatom, and you can see it has this sort of like interlocking um, chain forming valves. And I will get a picture of this. Probably one where we can see a bit of the structure a bit better. You can see the actual girdle bands that are wrapped around it here. And then there's a section without girdle bands. Um, and the division between them. And then these sort of interlocking uh, spines that connect the valves together.
Hey Dell, how's it going? Thank you for giving Dell a shout out, by the way. <laughs> it's not junk, it's a treasure hoard. You love the silica flagellates? Um, if I get a nice uh, view of a silica flagellate that's not filled with a treasure hoard, uh, Ariel, I will take a picture. Yeah, sorry I missed your message uh, before I moved away from that diatom uh, on a... I should probably just uh, have you in the Discord in my ear so you can yell at me when you want me to do something and I don't have that uh, streaming delay and SEM uh, issue. Okay, I'm gonna take this picture and then we'll zoom out and do one of the whole chain. Oh, you like the new, uh, the stuff? Yeah. Do I have a command for the genus on the red one? Uh, it's a Stephanodiscus coruscus. So I don't have a command for it, but I could make it if you'd like. Sorry, I'm just scanning backwards through the chat so that I can move forward through the chats. Uh, just busy learning and trying to stop yourself from psyching yourself out about this potential career opportunity. Oh, something cool coming your way, Dell? Um... I don't know what, uh, what, how do I tell what Pora Syra is, uh, Hana, I don't know the difference. So maybe explain it and then I'll see if I can find it. This one's Peralia, for sure. I kept looking for a nice view of Peralia from the top, where we could see the sort of star-shaped pattern on the valve face. But uh, I haven't had any luck with it. Because when they're really small, they're usually in a chain like these. And so they usually end up laying on their side rather than laying with the valve face exposed. Nothing is impossible, not if you can imagine it. Uh, let's see. Let's go like 80. It's a pretty good guess. Sometimes I'm okay at this. Uh, all right. Just gonna tighten that. Uh, magnification. picture of this whole Peralia.
Corsair has processes all over the valve face and areoli in irregular shapes. This otherwise looks like the Lassiosyra. So if I go back to the one that had all of those uh, strutted processes on the valve face, you think that was Porosyra? Uh, yeah, this is a diatom belonging to the genus Peralia. This is a, a whole colony of them, uh, JP. And it's a little bit, uh, I need to sh 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 shrink it a little bit so you can see it. It's round, so it looks like the Lysis I read. All round things in the ocean are approaching the Lassiosyra shape. Uh, on some level, right? Uh, yeah, so this is um, a marine diatom. Diatoms are a type of uh, algae, for lack of a better word. They're single-celled organisms that have chloroplasts. And um, this one makes colonies. The colonies are separated by um, these sort of crenulated surface that sort of interlocks one valve to another. So that's a whole cell right there. They're really short, little crown-shaped single cells um, for this group. And then there's a dividing line that separates the two valves in half right here. So that's one valve, one whole frustule, rather. And then the next whole frustule is here, and then the next one is here, and the next one, this is half of one down here at the end. So uh, this one got ripped apart from the, ripped open um, across the connection between the two valves. Um, but this one's a whole ends with a whole diatom out here. It's a little bit like the Leaning Tower, isn't it? I should do one where uh, where I tilt it a little bit and then I could set it in the background of the Leaning Tower. Uh, I could probably clip it. I could probably clip the whole thing and then I could put it in this, the landscape of the Leaning Tower of Pizza. That would be uh, a funny thing to do. Uh, let's see if I can figure out how to do that in Photoshop, Mama. Also, welcome in. All right. Uh, this is Peralia Colony. Um, sometimes Peralia, because they're very costate, very heavily solidified, will... Um, uh, make their way into freshwater environments and not be completely destroyed. this little guy? Is that just clay in there? Oh no, it's the internal view of Actinopticus. This is a nice clean one actually, just very small, but this is the internal view. Um, these are the Rima Portula, and then it has a series of uh, elevated and depressed sectors. You can see that the Rima Portula are always in the depressed sectors or if you're on the outside of the diatom there, the raised sector, sectors. And um, I thought we could get nice and tight with these and get a nice picture. Somewhere around here. Uh, a lot of times you get a good view of a diatom like this. I just take a picture because I might not find another one. 
um, that's not covered with junk or uh, broken in some way. So this one is neither broken nor covered with junk. So we can see all the details of the inside without having to, you know, use our brain to fill in patterns. There's just a little bit of clay here and that's it. Slightly dissolved, very slightly. But you can see how thick the cell wall is on, uh, on Actinopticus. It's a very thick valve. Nice cap. Oh, thank you. Uh, this is um, it's actually a hat that Pacific Plankton knit for me. Um, you can see it's a hand knit, high quality. Uh, I'm told it's made from yak wool. Uh, Is it wool for yaks? I think we had this conversation where I was asking that question before. Uh, and Pacific has already come and gone. So uh, can't answer that question for us. But um, it's starting to fuzz a little bit right there. Uh, she's working on another hat for me right now, I guess because she needs something to do with her hands. And uh, I redeemed her super follower $100,000 point reward in her channel. And, uh, and then I got, I'm, it's going to be a hat with an octopus design on it. And then, um, hey, spider ID, hello. Uh, thank you for the raid. If you're um, coming into the channel just now with Spider ID, we are looking Good at news, uh, diatoms on a uh, scanning electron microscope. The spider? Oh, why don't I have a command for Spider ID? You should have your own command in here. Uh, we can just give you a shout out the old fashioned way. Thank you for rating. Um, if you're not following Spider ID, you should probably follow them, unless you don't like spiders, um, you know, like, that make you upset for some reason. But maybe that's a good reason to follow Spider ID, uh, because he demystifies them for you a little bit. Um, but he does uh, streams, usually from his stereo microscope, looking at uh, spiders and then classifying them. And... Uh, they aren't alive, right? Yeah, so they're dead spiders. That's that's actually a good point to make. Although, um, I thought I thought I saw one time you went to, um, you went out into the field, and then you actually would have probably observed some live spiders in your field collections. But you're right. Uh, it is probably a good way to end your spider phobia is by looking closely at them and checking out the sort of intricate nature of them. And I am a fan of little things that are intricate. So uh, spiders classify in that category for me. I also feel if you just watch those uh, Lucas the Spider um, YouTube videos, you'll get over your fear of spiders a little bit because that spider is super cute. Uh, I actually think all jumping spiders just look really cute to me. Um, but I do a lot of macro photography, and um, so little uh, insects and and uh, and spiders don't bother me at all. I just get my face up real close to them, not to the point where I'm actually like uh, touching them, but within a couple of centimeters of them, and I'm never bothered by them. So uh, they usually hide from me, 
I want to get really close, so I had to move very slowly, but um, I like spiders for macro photography because they sit still. Uh, they, um, a lot of the little things move too quickly and it's hard to focus on them, but spiders will just sit there um, unless you startle them. They'll just kind of hang out. And so I actually really like that about spiders. Uh, well, for for macro photography, it's great. These are uh, diatoms from San Francisco Bay that we're looking at, and um, I've just been on the one stub, sort of bouncing around. I'm kind of looking for uh, new things, different things um, in the samples, but uh, not anything in particular. So. Um, if you see something and you think, oh, that's super cool, and I don't stop to look at it, it's probably because um, I've taken images of it before. And, um, and while I might be bored with it, other people probably would not be. So um, also, just as a note, it's hard for me to see what's going on in the chat while I'm uh, operating the actual SEM. So if you make comments, um, just keep in mind that I'll Eventually, I'll get back to it uh, as soon as I go to take a picture, usually. So I like to try to space out the pictures easily and um, evenly enough that I can actually sort of interact with people. But uh, it is sometimes a challenge because uh, the SEM kind of requires all of my attention to get things into focus and, and find us something interesting to look at closely. Um, if you haven't been to the channel before, uh, we look at lots of things on the scanning electron microscope, not just diatoms, but my specialization is in diatoms. But my specialization is not in marine diatoms, so just keep that in mind. Um, but I do have a friend in the channel here, Anna, who's a marine diatomist, and so uh, she frequently hangs out with us, which I appreciate, because um, when I can't figure out what I'm looking at, I can ask her, and then she can tell me why. I got something wrong. She actually knows the freshwater diatoms too, so. Not sure what this is. It's not a diatom. Maybe it's a dinoflagellate. Uh, or it could be a pollen grain. Those are my first guesses right now. Um, but a lot of times we find bits and pieces of things and I can't figure out what they are because Either we don't see enough of it, or I'm just not familiar with whatever it is. This one, I think, is a Delasia Syra. That's a Rimuportula, and it's surrounded by a uh, Photoportula on the, on the margin, a ring of them. So that's pretty well behaved, true Delasia Syra, I believe. Why don't we, yeah, there's another pollen grain. This one's pine pollen, actually. I know that one. Um, we do occasionally come across pollen grains in samples. Good news, everyone! This is... The very surface of the pollen grain. Um, one of the things that's nice about the scanning electron microscope is there's no limit, really, to how far we can zoom in. Just um, it gets a little fuzzier when we get kind of closer to it. But... That's a sort of typical Mickey Mouse shape that uh, pine pollen takes. The two big ears and then the central sac. Is this the Porosara? Is this the one you were talking about? Oh no, because it has uh, all over the valve face little striated processes. And those uh, areoli look irregular.
I'll take a picture. Podosar? Podosar? Podosar. Okay. You find Lucas the spider scarier than the real ones now? Oh, well. Um, I always liked Johnny jumping spiders, but I grew up around wolf spiders and they are terrifying. I think actually wolf spiders are also cute. I don't know, they look fuzzy. And uh, uh, I sometimes show them to my students in one of my classes where we talk about um, our selected species, a species that um, make many offspring. And then um, spiders are one of those groups where uh, like a wolf spider covered with little baby spiders, like the entire abdomen basically is how they carry them around. And um, it takes students a little while to recognize what they're looking at, but it's like, oh, here's the spider. And then the abdomen is just covered with little tiny baby spiders. That freaks some people out. But I actually think they look cute. So um, thank you for the follows. You see, it works on Windows 7. Yeah, sorry. That's just the way it, it runs. Uh, pine pollen is uh, all in my Pacific Northwest samples, regardless of sampling time or location. Yeah, that's actually one of the problems with pine, even when people analyze pine, is that um, uh, is that it's all over the place. So I know carrying babies around is a pattern that's a little bit more case selected, but um, but the number of babies that they have as an offspring is definitely an R selected behavior. And actually, what we talk about in that class is how things occur across the spectrum and that you can't just basically um, immediately place them in one or the other. Um, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, and this is an example for how you can have things that sort of range across that boundary. But it's definitely more on the R selected side given that it makes many, many, many offspring and it doesn't actually take care of them for very long. It just carries them briefly. Um, it doesn't actually nurse them or train them. It, compare that with like a bear or an elephant that has babies very infrequently. Um, that's, uh, and, and then basically raises them for two or three years. Um, that's pretty different, so. Um, the thing in the center, that's just some broken, I think that's just some broken areoli. I don't think those are actual features. when Mr. Burns says good news, yeah. It's not a porous syrup. Okay, well. Well, what is it then? Uh, Costa de discus? You're the boss. I just uh, take pictures of round things. I'm just gonna call it round thing. Round thing. There, now it's solved. Uh, I mean, it does have striated processes all over the valve face, though. Okay. Let's, uh... Let's jump around to the other sample. I have another sample that's got the same stuff in it. Uh, and then one sample that has, uh... different from a different week but more or less the same stuff and then i have some june lake stuff um i have a lot more time today so we might spend some time it might be a slightly longer stream where we can look at some of the other things this is a um actinopticus it's actually the sorry this is a um Asteromphalus, and this is actually one of the um the new emotes right this is uh, one of the follower emotes that we have now. Uh, this one, bloop. There it is. Almost identical to the picture, actually. It's almost in the same orientation. It's a cute Thalassiosaira, okay. 
Kerber on the inside, one rim of Portugal is Thalassocyra. Okay. Well, now we know. Now we have the uh, characteristic structure associated with them. And, um, and then I can figure it out. Except for I don't know what does that mean for, for porous Syrah. So it just processes the over the vowel face isn't enough, right? It needs to have something else that we use to characterize it. Uh, I take a picture of that uh, Asteromphalus, but it's got uh, got some junk uh, covering it. This one just it's a little piece of uh, has one process in the center, but you can see the broken structure of the chambering out here of the valve face. So that's kind of cool. Also, uh, welcome in studio. And um, since we have some people here, if you're interested in the, um, this uh, coloring contest that I've started, uh, we've got about two weeks before you need to um, make your submission for the coloring contest. If you want to uh, win the gift certificate for Redbubble that uh, we're offering. So to the winner, and then there'll probably be, if there's enough entrance, then we'll probably have a runner-up uh, award as well. You can color it however you like, but if you're interested in learning how I color them, you can uh, check out that video. And then um, you'll, you know, it's not a, a how-to or a step-by-step, -step, but it gives you the tools and sort of talks about how I have used Photoshop to colorize images. So um, all of the art that's below me in that little image, um, I either colorized using Photoshop or Lightroom, or um, some of them might be from when I was still using GIMP, and some of them are probably uh, done in Procreate on my iPad. So I use a range of tools. That's uh, Cyclotella literalis again. It's an internal view. And this is a uh, custom discus per perforatus. I think it's the one that we decided that was. Its valve face is covered with rimaportula. It's a whole bunch of little labiate processes that look like a bunch of mammals. Um, I can zoom in on one of them, and I need to change the beam intensity a little so we can see more of the detail. This one's like uh, a little penguin face right now, you can see that, only it has three eyes. Nobody's terrified of a three-eyed penguin, are they? I should get Sylvia to draw me a three-eyed penguin. That's like a little perfect three-eyed penguin right there. And then I'll add that as a follower emote, creep people out. Many more than three eyes, but the three eyes here look like they go together with the little beak. Looks good. What it needs, I think, probably is a mustache, though, or maybe a beard. We'll see. three-eyed penguin. <laughs> exactly. It's a little three-eyed penguin. Uh, you don't think a penguin could wear a beard or like a mustache? 
I feel like, uh, I feel like they could. Don't. Okay. It's gonna ruin the penguin if I put a mustache on it. What if we just gave it googly eyes? I definitely feel like we could put googly eyes on it. And the problem is I only have two googly eyes, so I'd have to clone it. I can try. Let's see what we can do. We can do this. There's one eye. Maybe we put it towards the bottom of it. We'll put one here. Put a little googly eye over here. Look at that. You don't like that? I think that looks good. It's a little three-eyed penguin. Oh, now I've got to... Uh-oh. You keep up with the eye movements. This is actually a challenge. Let's see. Uh, edit transform. Let's make it like minus 30. I have one eye looking the other way. It's not cute? I think it's cute. <laughs> it stopped moving, so let me fix it. Hang on. Uh, this is costing a discus. Just call it three eyes. Let me fix this so that it's scaled correctly. There we go. And then I just need to make some adjustments here. We'll put one there, one there. I think maybe this needs to be transformed as well. way over the other way. There we go. <laughs> I think it looks good. No beard required for this one. We just have a penguin with three eyes. And uh, you got back right in time for a three-eyed penguin. Oh, we got a chef's kiss from the chef. <laughs> Excellent. Um, I mean, who doesn't want a three-eyed penguin? Okay. So, sorry, just having a little fun. I need about five more eyes, uh, and then we can make uh, we can make it a uh, a spider penguin uh, for spider ID. Who? Very uh, graciously rated us. And then, let's see if I... Just do that. I feel like that's an interesting collection of them. Not a lot of junk. It's a whole wall of... Uh, penguins with multiple eyes. <laughs> it's not your vibe. <laughs> I 
Okay, Rocket Sage. We've got uh, got some science communicating royalty here in the channel with us. Hello, Rocket Sage. How are you doing? Uh, we're just uh, decorating some diatoms with uh, googly eyes. I beat you to it. Um, how are you doing, Rocket? These are some uh, diatoms from San Francisco Bay. And we're just looking at them on the old scanning electron microscope. Typical quiet afternoon on the SEM. Uh, you're well, you're working on lectures. I love your stream so much. I never even have enough time to watch it. Well, um, I feel like that happens, you know, being professors, hard work and preparing for uh, putting lectures together is actually extremely time consuming. And I don't think people have a good sense of it um, as a, a I think I have put together something like 22 courses now in my lifetime. Um, I can tell people that uh, it never gets any easier. And it sometimes gets a little bit less time consuming. I think when I first started writing um, lectures for courses and putting together lectures for courses, it took me about 10 hours to put together a one hour lecture and to make it look good and um, and to make it basically coherent and then this fall uh, this fall I don't have any new classes but um, last spring this past spring I had to put together two new classes while I was teaching three classes that I already knew and uh, I didn't have any breaks and I think it maybe took me about well, one of them was mostly field work, so it was like a field class, so that one wasn't actually very challenging, but it still took up some time, maybe five, five hours a week or something. But the other class, I mean on top of the class time, but the other class was brand new, and I probably spent um, maybe eight hours for every one hour in, in lecture, um, putting them together. So uh, it's incredibly time consuming. So anybody who's working on new courses always has my sympathy because uh, I know from putting them together that it's just it's an incredible amount of work. And I don't think students recognize that. I don't think they realize like how much effort goes into putting a good lecture together. So um, I think my um, PhD students are sometimes forced to, well, they have to teach one class before they uh, graduate, typically, and um, and I give them all the materials. Like I give them all my exams that I put together, all of the uh, exercises or homeworks. I give them all of the lectures, and I think it still takes them probably five or six hours to at least each time to go through the lecture, kind of make it their own, to to spend enough time to really get a handle on um, on what they're going to say for every slide and um, and so I, I mean I think even with the background materials it's sort of a challenge to uh, to gauge exactly like how to to you know build the lectures my wife is kind of crazy about uh, her lectures she goes through um, since COVID, basically, she's been recording them, and then she's uh, she's been sort of redesigning all of the classes that she teaches. But uh, she'll record them, and then she'll go through the transcription and fix all of the typos and punctuation in the transcription. And then she also will, uh, which is they're usually funny to me, so I just leave them. But uh, and then she has developed like a new in-class exercise for practically every lecture that she gave. Um, and so that's just a ton of extra grading, but it, I don't usually do that. Um, I just sort of try to make the class as similar to the way that I taught it if I'm gonna teach it online. But yeah, so it's a lot of work. 
and um, I don't think people appreciate it in part because they don't know. Uh, I think students just think we work for an hour, <laughs> you know, three hours a week teaching a class, and that's the only time they see us. So they think that it, it's just three hours of throwing together, you know, grabbing an old lecture and, and then uh, talking in front of it. They don't realize uh, even that's a challenge. So. Here's a, a little radiolarian. If you want to see something a little different besides just diatoms. It's a little over brightened because it's sticking out at us. And um, anything that's really spiny, the SEM has a hard time. They show up as very bright objects. So I think we can probably get this to look okay. I just Nothing need to is impossible. Not if you can imagine. The brightness it. settings a bit. Um, and this SCM is actually really good at. I mean, it's a high quality SCM. It's relatively new, and I take good care of it. But um, it's it's actually pretty good at. It, it doesn't do auto focusing very well because it doesn't know what you want to focus on. But. Um, but it does do the brightness contrast pretty well. And I usually have to put stuff through some sort of a um, final processing, but it usually does a pretty good job of adjusting the, the balance for the brightness and contrast so that you can get images like this that would normally be over brightened in parts um, to be visible without uh, Without looking too bad. So a little adjustments usually need to be made, but I think this is a pretty nice view of our radiolarian. I like to think of them as little tiny snowmen. They're kind of like lacy hurricane globes, or I don't know if there's a good uh, object you can think of. There's not a good food object for them, which is probably why I can't figure out what they normally are, because I just use food objects for, for uh, comparing things typically. I don't know if there's a food that looks like radiolarian. Oh, you wanted to thank me for sharing the SCM on socials. Um, it's actually, uh, I think it's a good way to introduce people to a variety of things in the scanning electron microscope. And I've, um, I put a lot of effort into colorizing them and that sort of thing um, and sharing them because I want people to use them and see them and um, uh, it's, you know, science communication is a challenge always uh, because you're looking at things people can't pick up. Um, and so a lot of people don't know what a diatom is um, or they don't know what any of these microorganisms are. And so I feel like at least giving them pictures of them is a way to, um, to sort of bridge that gap um, I also have like little 3D models and things that people can print that uh, I put, that I made accessible to everybody, but not everybody has access to a 3D printer. Um, but I feel like it's a way for sort of bridging that gap a little bit. And I think pulling, um, letting people see the sort of beauty of these very small objects um, where they might not normally see them. Um, they're invisible, right? So without a microscope, which most people don't have, um, or some substantial training, you, you probably just wouldn't know what they were or what to look for, so. <laughs> if it wasn't in PowerPoint, it didn't exist. Um, you know, like, uh, if I could avoid using PowerPoint, like, I would, but it's got so much power to give people images. Um, I mean, you could use any any tool, but uh, if you want to take somebody in like, uh, uh, like a, a lot of my lectures are sort of virtual field trips. We go to places or we go into environments and I want people to get a sense of that environment. It's hard to do without pictures. And um, I sometimes talk about like when I was learning. Hey, back when I was a kid. When I was learning from my professors, they just had an overhead projector 
um, for figures, or they would just draw them. And um, they would just write all the things that they were saying as they were saying on the board. So their handwriting on a, on a board, a chalkboard, was uh, quite good. And I can't really replicate that. I can't write fast enough uh, on a board to actually keep up with them uh, the way that they could. But um, so PowerPoint actually kind of has some positives, but I think that a lot of people also get bored with it. Um, so I tend to, uh, for my lectures, I tend to have like a little bit of text and a picture, a little bit of text and a picture so that there's always something that people can kind of um, look at. And then, um, so it's not just reading stuff. But also, uh, I feel like I don't put a lot of information on each slide so that I'm rapidly sort of moving through them. And I feel like both of those things kind of keep people alert uh, a little bit more. I think it's uh, hard enough for them to stay awake through a science lecture with the, you know, my voice lulling them to sleep or whatever. Um, I try to be dynamic and try to keep my lectures engaging, but I also feel like some people just don't care or they're just not that interested in the topic. So it kind of depends on who I'm talking to. The upper level classes are often a little bit easier to keep people engaged. The entry level classes, I feel like oftentimes I'm kind of have to be a bit of a clown to keep their attention, or you kind of have to have something kind of super interesting. Uh, you know, just having some dad jokes stuck in there doesn't cut it, so. Uh, I don't know which diatom this is. It's creating long colony, and we're looking at the valve face, and this looks kind of Thalassiosyra like, but um, I think everything looks like Thalassiosyra in the marine realm, so I'll let uh, Anna tell me what, what I got wrong. Um, they, she still sort of puts herself into the course, so she records things, uh, Captain, but, um, but then the class has just a lot more active learning then, so. Good news, everyone! Yeah. Hello, me, Fox. Uh, thank you for the follows. Sorry, I've been, uh, tinkering with the SEM, trying to figure out what I'm looking at and to get something good. Um, yeah, backscatter detector doesn't help us very much for, uh, for my images because it's all silica, but I understand you were looking probably at minerals. Uh, so a lot more uh, of the mineralogy is useful to have backscatter tools for. So. Yeah. Uh, when I was in school and I took notes, I actually took my notes in four different colors while people were talking. I would, I had like, I used ultra um, fine point Sharpies to, to take my notes in and I would just move between the colors. I kept all my pens like in my fingers. I don't know if my professors were confused by it or fascinated by it but I would draw graphics in black and then I would take my notes in blue and then I would like highlight things with the other colors or I would use hey, colors Maui, to try to separate Saui. sections um oh thank you for the gifts or subscription um rocket sage you know you don't need to do that but that's very nice um and uh, for people who are new to the channel we just got uh, actually just got the uh follower emotes last night so I added a bunch of new emotes and then um, I uh, changed some of the existing emotes a little bit 
so they're um, sort of different ones. Some new colors, some different diatoms, uh, just to change things up a bit. So sorry, I was monkeying around looking at chat and missed the uh, missed the uh, reset here I needed to do. Um, <laughs> my voice is quite soothing. I get that kind of a lot. Um, let's see. Yeah, so. Uh, let's see. I don't think so much PowerPoint have all been through bad or needless PowerPoints. The problem is when PowerPoint prolongs the presentation. Yeah, I don't, I don't try not to do that. <laughs> what <about> uncle jokes? <laughs> I suppose hey, you Maui, could know what's going Maui. on here. <laughs> Sam Shugs got you back, uh, Rocket Sage. Uh, thank you, Sam. Um, we're making my screen blow up with diatom emotes. Um, that looks like a microphone. That does look a little bit like a microphone. Uh, it's round. I mean, it has a, it looks like it has a series of ring of processes, so I don't know. Uh, Let's see. This is actually a marine sample, and um, I don't study marine diatoms, so uh, it's an estuary sample, to be honest. But um, so there's a, occasionally some freshwater stuff slips in. But um, these are samples from Pacific Plankton, who um, sends me stuff periodically, and then I just put it on the scanning electron microscope so that we can sort of show people in her uh, streams some of the things that she comes across in her uh, live materials and. I think Pack is back, or maybe she's not, but um, if you're not following Pacific Plankton, she moderates for me, and I moderate for her. Uh, she's still here. She's popping in and out today. Um, so there's a raid train, a hyper train, sorry, going on in my channel, which I don't see very frequently. Um, but uh, let's see. The Sharpie smell would drive you nuts. Well, don't huff it. Just, you know. I put them on the caps. I just use use it to write. Are there any structures on the face? It's like a little clock-like structure right here on the face, and that's all I can see. And then you can see there's some little pores around on the mantle. Look at those mantle pores. Um, aside from that, I'm not totally sure. Let's see. Uh, yeah, Pacific and I um, share a lot of, uh, of our followers and also a lot of our content sometimes. So, and uh, I don't know how many months ago that was. Is it two months ago now? Pacific actually came to my uh, lab and we did some streams together um, while she was running the SCM, which was kind of cool. Looking at freshwater stuff or marine stuff, just whatever. I think we also looked at bugs and stuff. So um, I'm just gonna call this round thing number two because uh, I don't know what it is, and Anna's not, help, not, Anna's not yelling out answers at me, and neither is Pacific Plankton. So uh, until, uh, until we start looking at freshwater stuff uh, and I don't know the answer to something, I'm just going to call it a round thing. It's a, it's a, uh, a column, a, a uh, colony of diatoms. Here's another radiolarian, by the way. We just passed by it. It's a different one. Um, these little triangle ones, they're actually prisms, um, are uh, detillum. This is a side view of detillum. Here's the whole, we can actually see the whole fresh tool. This is a version of the whole fresh tool. There's one of the vowel faces that's separated from the fresh tool. And there's what it looks like in vowel view, looking at it from the top. And that's one of the things that's kind of challenging about diatoms is that they're three-dimensional objects. And so you can see this thing looks like somebody put a marshmallow on a skewer. But if we zoom in and look at it, um, what you'll see is that, one, it's a lot more intricate up close, like a lot more intricate up close. And these are the girdle bands that surround it. These are the vowel face. And so the girdle bands basically link two vowel faces together. That's the normal structure for a diatom. And then it has a, a process, a rima portula process here that links to this long um, tube 
And you can see the tube doesn't actually go all the way through. It just extends from the valve face outward. Um, and then we're seeing a sort of fringy structure around the outside. Um, so this is just one of those. It's a piece of one of those, but the one valve without the other valve being present. So that's how diatoms work. Um, they have two valves and then girdle bands that connect them. That's their structure for all diatoms. And um, so this is a side view of the diatom. It's basically just laying on its side. The valve face is triangular though. So like one surface of one edge of it is on the bottom. And then the other two is sort of pointed at us, creating a sort of a triangular face. And if we just go a little bit, so I zoomed out a little bit, this is the same diatom. And we can just go over to this one. You can see what it looks like when you look at it from the valve face downward. So there's that tube that was sticking out at us. Here's the little fringe of stuff that goes around the outside that look like little eyelashes, right? They, they actually only occur from here to here and then here to here. And then there's a gap on all of them all the way around. And then this is what the valve face looks like. And here's the little spine just jutting right out of the screen at us. And this is the, the rest of the valve face out here. And this one's a little bit broken, but we can actually zoom in and you can see some of the detail. Um, these are the areoli. They have a little tiny um, covering that's connected to create little C shapes. See, it's like two little C's. Here's one and here's one. So there's actually a little connecting piece here. And then the rest of this little plate covers over a hole in the valve face. And they're all sort of like that. Sometimes this one has little three little C shapes instead of two, but this one has four. That's not really important. But their little coverings or occlusions that go over the pore. Uh, and that's because they want the opening, but they don't want an opening that's so large that things can get in there um, and do damage to the cell. So they often create a little covering that goes over those openings. And um, if we zoom out a little bit, we can actually see that those structures are all over the valve face. And it has a sort of a, um, a wavy structure as it gets out towards the outside edge. And then I think we can focus on, we can scroll up and just focus on the end of the tube, which is kind of interesting. Um, so like a photograph, we can only have so much of the image in focus at the same time. So if we're focused up here, all this stuff looks kind of blurry. But um, here we're looking straight down that tube and you can see that it's an open tube. It's not a solid spine. And also it's got these little tiny like teeth that are sticking up from the valve face and a little bit of it's broken right here. This is sort of a spectacular view of it. Um, because you can see all of the little structure that's on that valve face and just how, even though it's this tiny little thing, this dust sized particle, and we're looking at it at 20,000 times magnification right now. Um, you can see all of this sort of uh, amazing detail associated with it. Uh, this is a kind of a neat photo. So I'm going to go ahead and take a picture like this. Um, with the rest of the diatom kind of out of focus behind it, but the, just the the two part in, in focus, because I think that looks kind of cool. Very artsy, but um, I kind of like artsy photos sometimes for science stuff because it, it illustrates things um, in a way that captures people's imaginations. And also it gives me a chance to come see what people are talking about in the channel. So... Um, let's see... Uh, do I image other fossils? Yes. Um, whatever I have, um, you know, we'll look at. Um, the one thing I haven't looked at very much in, um, in streams, I haven't looked at actually a lot of like just mineral samples, but I do have a, um, a typical geological slide holder that we can use that will mount into this. And so if I had some stuff in thin section, I could put it on there. Um, if you have some thin sections you don't mind sacrificing to sputter coating and you want to send some to me, um, I can put some in there. 
have some in the labs in here, but I mostly have sedimentary rocks. And so a lot of the sedimentary, um, I mean, I have stuff from my thesis and, and whatever that I could, that I wouldn't mind sacrificing, but it's largely sedimentary rocks. So I feel like it would be a little less exciting than some of the volcanic stuff um, or just pure mineral samples, maybe. Um, Good news, everyone! You love Sharpie. Look, you just don't like the smell. Yeah. I think it was two months ago you were here at Pacific, right? It was a while ago. Um... You're gonna keep lurking. Okay, thank you. Thanks for hanging out uh, and for chatting. I know it's hard when you're a streamer to actually like spend a lot of time in other people's streams. So I always appreciate it when people come in and hang out and interact with my community a little bit. And I really do hope that you check out um, Rocket Sage. She does um, geology streams. She does some of her um, lecture preparations. Um, she plays games and. I heard she sings. Is that true? You sing? You play music and sing? But I don't think I've ever seen one of those streams. So, um, I don't know. Maybe you haven't done a lot of uh, musical stuff recently. But um, I haven't seen those. So, and I think uh, you were nominated for some, uh, for some streamer award for educational content for women, which I think is actually awesome uh, for, uh, for science-y stuff and for gaming. So... You want to see little fluffy leg things? Oh, uh, from Pacific's thing. Okay, yeah. There's <laughs> a lot of fluffy leg things like copepods. Um, let's see. Oh, I do have a, a red bubble site. And then, as I mentioned earlier, there's a coloring contest. You could win $20. I'm planning on giving away to the community. Um, for coloring some diatom image that I posted on to the Discord. So, um, crinoids are your favorite. If you make that happen, I'll look at any. I actually have crinoids that I collected from the field last week. Um, and I could easily mount some and put them in the SEM. Uh, let me talk to one of the students because I gave her all of them uh, that I had collected. They weather out of the rock face. We're looking at some southern Indiana limestones for, uh, for my Sedstrack class. And um, let me see if she will let me steal one of them and we'll put it on the SEM for you. Um, also, I probably have some that we made into thin sections. So I could probably put some of the thin sections in the SEM as well. So. Um, I hardly game anymore. I write, sing, play. Oh, but Nothing you get nervous. Nothing is impossible. Not if you can um, imagine it. You're never leaving. Uh, yeah, so my Sedstrack class went to look at some... Um, we're doing... We're in the environments of deposition sort of mode for the class. And we went down south because there's some really nice outcrops where road cuts, basically, um, where we can look at... Uh, combination of siliciclastic and carbonate environments and um, there's some really neat uh, rugos corals uh, some Archimedes coils associated with the bryozoan and uh, there's a lot of crinoids like everywhere in those samples including like little calyxes um, that we see weathered out and then um, a lot of brachiopods and uh, sort of standard uh, you know, snails and clams that we see in those materials. So, uh, I'm at Indiana State University, so uh, I'm a full professor here, and um, it's Terre Haute, Indiana, so for the city. And I don't mind sharing that because you're going to find it very easily if you just uh, Good news, go to everyone. My Twitter account with the same name, and uh, it's my professional account basically. Um, so I'm, I'm happy to share that. It's fine. Nobody stalks me because I'm old and a dude. So, you know, nobody, nobody wants to, um, <laughs> to stalk me. 
<laughs> I'm not that interesting for them. Uh, the the Tillum, T T Y L U M, the Tillum spine. It's not actually a spine, um, but let's zoom back out, and we'll do a picture where we focus on the other part. Um. I should point out that when I first started streaming, um, I think that Rocket Sage was the first science streamer that I kind of engaged with outside of uh, Dell Maximum and Pacific Plankton. And um, she was very welcoming, invited me to her, uh, to her Discord and um, sort of chatted with me. And, um, and then we've interacted, you know, occasionally since then, but... Um, Let's take a look at these. So we've known each other basically for the entire time that I've been streaming. And um, she sort of got me enrolled in the, um, the Knowledge Fellowship. And I'm pretty sure we have a ability to shout out the Knowledge Fellowship as well here. If you can, if Pacific Plankton's got a second to do that. Let's get a picture of this just in the central part with the where the spine originates. Yeah, we're all busy. And um, thank you for doing that. Um, so if you're interested in science content, you should check out uh, the Knowledge Fellowship. Very supportive group. Um, and check out their Discord. Um, they, um, they work really hard to make sure that science streaming is sort of at the forefront. And here's Sarah Holcomb just on time uh, and um, you gotta go okay thanks Pacific for for hopping in and out also if you like um, microscope streamers um, I have a whole list of them right here it's not all of them uh, but these are the ones that stream most frequently that um, that I know of and um, Pacific and Dell and I and open set and uh, and Spider ID are the ones that I know probably the best that stream most frequently. And then almost always microscope uh, streaming from, from that group plus myself. Um, Adele sometimes does, just does gaming uh, and sometimes he does drawing. But um, uh, Fazeri mostly sings and does music, but occasionally she does microscope stuff. And Freckled Science mostly right now is doing like 3D printing and things like that. But um, she occasionally pulls out a microscope and starts looking at stuff in the microscope, which is cool. Um, Porcelain Giant, Line Wizard, and um, uh, Pengaline and Nid, those guys are all kind of like either newer streamers or they don't stream that much. But they, when they do, they sometimes will stream from microscope. And then um, Jolkson's on all the time, uh, but he doesn't talk very much. He mostly just does like... Here's what's on my microscope stage. Um, so it's a little bit more shy, but uh, good content. So if you if you like microscope streamers and you streamers and you, or uh, microscope content and you're just looking for somebody who um, who does that, you should uh, just go through and follow everybody in that list. I don't think that you'll uh, you'll be disappointed by any of it. Thanks, Anna. I um, I work hard to take good photos. You know for SEM stuff. And uh, your old boss, Beth, contacted me, um, I think two days ago. Uh, Beth Cassie is another diatomist who um, works in the marine realm and um, was Anna's uh, PhD advisor. And um, she asked me some questions about um, how I get good, such good images from the SEM and, um, and my sort of preparation techniques, which I didn't realize were different from other people's, but apparently I sort of do things a little bit differently than uh, the traditional approaches. So um, I get that question from kind of a lot of people now, I'm kind of like, um, because I do so much SEM work and I have my own SEM in my lab. Uh, I have an old, my own SEM lab, I should say. Uh, that I get a lot of like, how do you do this? Or uh, how do I get the images to look the way that I do? Or more commonly, what's my sample prep? 
um, like how do I prepare materials? I get those questions kind of a lot. So let's take a look at this thing in girdle view, side view of it, so we can have like the whole thing characterized. These little spines are actually pretty amazing to me. They look like eyelashes and um, they have a lot of sort of inherent detail in them that I think is kind of cool to explore. So you can see that they actually, um, they're like the head of a needle almost. They have like an opening in them. I don't know why, um, but they also have like a little crenulated surface on the top of them, which is also kind of cool. And it's sort of like intricacies of the, um, of diatoms that I think is kind of, makes them a little bit more fascinating um, than some of the other organisms. Cause they just have like, I mean, we're looking at this thing right now, like here I zoom in, we can see the, the actual heads of these sort of um, uh, little spine-like structures that fringe the outside of the valve face. And, um, and you can see all of that in sort of incredible detail that's present on them. And right now we're at a magnification of about 16 and a half thousand times. And this thing is still basically just sort of making intricate, you know, forms uh, associated with that very fine, very small um, size. And what's also impressive about diatoms is that they're single-celled organisms. So this intricacy is coming from an organism that's just a single, a single cell. Um, it's not a multicellular organism. So it's just a single-celled algae. And this is the, the skeleton. This is what its skeleton looks like. So um, super intricate uh, nature to them, which I think is just endlessly fascinating. I could sit on my SEM and take pictures of diatoms all day long and never get bored with it, honestly. So um, probably a good thing that I decided to become a professor of, of diatoms. Look, Dell's here. Hello, Dell. Um, you should definitely check out Rocket Sage's uh, stream. And um, also, if you like uh, geology streamers, I should point out that um, uh, there's also Volcano Doc. And um, she does a lot of really great um, sort of just more focused on igneous rock sort of stuff. And Good Geo Jim as well. Yeah, uh, Geo Jim is a um, like a geologist assistant or something like that teacher um, in I think he's in Virginia, and, um, and so he also does some really cool stuff. Yeah, Volcano is um, starting to um, to do microscope stuff as well. So um, she talked with me. She was having some trouble getting the. Um, the height on her stage working and so we had some uh, conversation about microscope stuff she's trying to finish her phd so she's really close and um and i think that's basically taking precedence over her recent streaming but um as probably it should and then um she got the microscope but she's had to send it back to the uh well that picture right now below us is detilum on the valve face uh, and we're looking at it in girdle view so you can have both of them together um the uh, uh, microscope had to be sent back to get some repairs, and I haven't seen her since then doing any streaming, so, um, but I think that it was uh, a relatively easy fix. So she should be streaming probably in the next month or so um, from, from a light microscope looking at, a uh, petrographic light microscope looking at um, mineralogy a little bit more. So that'll be cool. Thanks for uh, pointing that out to me remembered that because I come to her streams pretty I, I pretty frequently when she's on and, uh, and we chatted a little bit about her microscope issues so <laughs> I'm the only one that you've seen get the mustaches in focus so well uh, what about the googly eyes? I don't know if you were here earlier, uh, Sarah, when I had uh, three googly eyes uh, on one of my images, and uh, it looked like a little penguin. I'd show it to you, but I didn't take a picture of it. I'm, I'm assuming somebody out there got a screen cap of it, but um, maybe in the 
in the VOD, if not. Okay, this is Datillum on Girdle View. And all of that structure that we saw on the valve face with respect to the areoli is actually, there's a lot of it present on um, on the side of the valve as well. So if I could get that to focus a little bit better, you might be able to see some of those. Um, this is uh, unprocessed material, and a lot of those other images are actually from uh, processed diatom material. So they... Um, they're a little bit clearer as a result. Okay, um, let's poke around a little bit more, see if I can find any dinoflagellates, which is really kind of what I was setting out to do when I started the stream. And I was looking at some of this um, low digestion prepped material. So I didn't actually do anything but rinse the samples um, and then sputter coat them. But um, it was mostly so that we could see any, uh, any sort of dinoflagellates that might be present. And so far, I haven't seen any. So a little disappointed. But um, also, they kind of look like bob blobs next to the diatoms. So it could be that we've passed some of them uh, and I didn't focus on it. It's always a possibility um, because they're a little bit well, they should be roughly this size, but they're a little bit harder to, for me to distinguish, whereas diatom shapes are like, oh, that's a diatom for sure, right? Um, they're, they're more geometric and, um, and symmetrical in particular. What is this little guy? Oh, it's just standing on its edge. That one, I think, actually is the Lassiocera. This is a... Ellerbeckia with its face broken open. The face of the diatom. Sarah, I think. I'll make a note to myself to get some crinoid stuff for Rocket Sage, and then I'll send you a ping let you know that I'm going to put some of it on so you don't miss it. Um, should be kind of uh, an interesting uh, stream, seeing how we don't usually look at larger fossils, but should be able to get some. Uh, not totally sure what that is. I need uh, I need to phone a friend. I feel like this is a Anna what is this moment. Oops, now it's gone. Maybe cockanese? Maybe it's the a rafid valve of a cockanese. It's definitely shaped like cockanese, but uh, this is like a totally weird structure on the stray for me. when you just play around in marine benthic diatoms. It's all kinds of things that I'm just not familiar with. Uh, what's happened? Oh, can't find porcelain giant. Hmm. I saw them on last night. Maybe I just have their name on there wrong. Hang on. 
Uh, let's see. Is it just giant? Yeah. Maybe I misspelled something in the other one. Titan without a face. Shiner Sean, I'm sorry I'm late. What are we looking at and how? We're looking at <laughs> and where? <laughs> We're looking at a uh, a series of different diatoms collected from San Francisco Bay. And diatoms are a type of microscopic algae. We're using a scanning electron microscope to look at them. And um, this is uh, current magnification for our sample is 13.62 thousand times so and the view field that you're looking at is roughly 25 microns so it's a 25 micron square and uh, scanning electron microscopes use electrons to see not light and so it draws the image for us by getting feedback from the sample so each point basically is a um, a bit of information that it collects as it scans across the surface with electrons and then the electrons that are fired into the sample um, actually inter interact with electrons in the sample and knock some of them out and the ones that get knocked out uh, it tries to capture and there's a couple of different ways that it can capture them it can, can capture them as backscattered electrons or as um, secondary electrons and the secondary electrons are the ones that are giving us topographic information. And backscatter electrons penetrate a little bit more deeply, and as a result, the electrons don't make it back to the uh, sensor as frequently. And we have to have a special sensor in, um, which is in that, um, in the, uh, uh, sorry, it's this way. There's a little picture of the inside of the chamber. There's like a little bar uh, on the far side. And, um, it uh, is actually the secondary detector, and I'm not using it currently, it's pulled out. But these are the images from the inside of the chamber. We're looking at one of these stubs. This is the cone, that's the secondary detector here. This little thing that's jutting into the field of view is actually EDAX, is an elemental analyzer. And these little things are just a little aluminum stubs. They are about 12.5 millimeters in diameter and about 10 millimeters tall. And the diatoms that we're looking at are on the surface of that. And they've been sputtered with gold. And um, that's so that they become uh, conductive, which is our intention to have uh, things that are conductive to remove any um, charge that builds up on the surface of them from blasting them with, uh, with electrons. Oh. It's a pretty clean version of uh, that Cirrella. I think this is Cirrella Gemma. It's a marine Cirrella. And I need to change the angle so that it's basically at 45 degrees, which means I need to add about, I want to say 25 degrees. I did a pretty good guess. Just maybe a little too far. It's like somewhere in between those. There we go. So that's a Cirrella. Uh, they have these fibula structures, which basically come all the way down from the valve margin all the way through to the valve face, um, to the central, uh, this central line that runs through the diatom. And the rape is actually circumferential for these diatoms, so it has a slit that goes all the way around the outside edge and then all the way around this edge as well. And then there's two valves, so it basically creates this sort of um, uh, margin that's all the way around the diatom, no matter which way it lands, where the raphe is touching some surface. And that's because the raphe is used for diatoms to crawl around. And not all diatoms have a raphe, but when they do, that's what they use it for and it sort of separates the planktic diatoms, the ones that are floating in the water column, from benthic diatoms. This is a benthic diatom, and we know that because it has a well-designed, uh, very large raphe system, which is basically how they crawl. So why would you have it if you didn't need it, right? Um, 
so you can use the f the form equals function sort of model for organisms pretty effectively and um, this is a nice clean version of that uh, diatom you can see all of the detail very nicely and um, so these are the little fibulae surface is covered with a bunch of little holes which we call areoli in diatoms and then the raphe is on the outside margin here and these are the fibula or costi like structures and that's a nice diatom with a lot of detail so i'm actually going to take a little bit slower photo um, so we can get slightly higher detail and that's one of the things about the scanning electron microscope. The faster it scans, the lower the resolution of the image. And um, so the quality of the beam and the width of the beam, like the amount of area that it affects or the spot size um, combined with the speed that it scans sort of gives you the quality of the image. And so this is a the highest that I usually will run on stream. It takes about 10 minutes to take the whole picture. So um, I just want to make sure that the brightness and, uh, and contrast settings look okay. And it seems like they do. Good news, everyone. And, um, so it's a really cool looking diatom. And then I can come back and sort of chat with channel a little bit. Uh, it looks like a Playtessa. Really? Okay. Um, let's see. You can't have a platessa there, I think. I agree. So not very much like, not a cockiness. Okay. Um, well, it's, uh, it's clear because I've slowed the beam down, right? Uh, I don't have a CT. Uh, we don't do the photoluminescence. Um, you can add one, uh, but I think it costs $30,000 to put in here. Um, would you use it for diatoms? No. But my lab is also used by other geologists, and so we talked about having a cathodal luminescence um, uh, added to the actual SCM. Um, just didn't think it was worth the, the price. So. Uh, Why would you have it if you don't need it? Exactly. Very much like Darwin would, would view it. Um, thank you for the follow, uh, White Star Flower. Uh, there's been a bunch of follows. If I didn't mention the individuals, I'll try to come back to it. Yeah. Um, they're very useful if you're doing like um, cement, um, like well, order of cementation yeah. and things like that, right? So you're so excited you just ordered a new microscope. Oh, what was wrong with your old microscope, Del? You're getting something a little bit uh, more high-end, one with two eyes uh, that you can look through. Oh, it's a travel microscope. Oh, that's cool. You need some ideas for camera upgrades. Uh, what, uh, what kind of camera? You mean like you want to upgrade your body or you want to upgrade the lens or what are you talking about to a studio? It will be here on Monday, and you're going to do an unboxing. Oh, that's exciting, Del. Uh, yeah, all the little holes are um, the areoli for diatoms. Are, uh, it's sort of a characteristic. It's something that happens on all diatoms, basically. If you don't find little holes, you probably aren't looking at a diatom. So uh, that, that's a, a good way to tell. Oh, the microscope camera. Um, normally, so, yeah, so what I, do you have a photo tube on the camera? You must. So, or, or are, you, are you going through the eyepiece? Because there are some cameras that mount through the eyepiece. Um, but if you have a photo tube, yeah, if it's trinocular, you can just get a adapter for a DSLR pretty easily to fit onto um, the trinocular port. What you usually can use uh, depending on what the adapter that you have for your microscope is, you can um, sometimes just mount them directly on there. So my camera has a, is a mirrorless, and all I needed in order to hook mine up was a C-mount, um, which basically takes the adapter and just redirects the light directly into the um, 
the inside of my camera. So I just hook it on there like the whole microscope becomes a lens, um, a prime lens basically for me. And, um, and then you just need to adjust the height of your column um, a little bit so that it's in focus when your eyes are in focus. Uh, otherwise you wouldn't need to do anything. If you don't have, uh, a, let's see, you should have an adapter connected between your camera and your current trinocular port. Um, so you, you could potentially also use what's called a T-mount, which is used for telescopes as well. Um, and a T-mount or a C-mount that will work. You do have an adapter, yeah. So you just need to get something that fits onto the adapter and then the only other problem that you might have is that a lot of times the adapters for cameras that are hooked up to the microscope are, they're like 0.5 adapters. Um, so the image might be kind of um, uh, blown up in the actual picture that you're looking at on the uh, sensor of your camera. So you need to basically get an adapter that fits the sensor of your camera or you can avoid having the, uh, the circle from the, the photo tube uh, by just zooming in digitally. So I did that for a little while. I just used the digital zoom on my camera to zoom us in so that we didn't have the circle. And then um, eventually I got an adapter that was a little bit uh, closer to the magnification that I need for the sensor for my camera. And um, so I'm assuming you have a digital camera that you have a DSLR or a mirrorless camera, those usually can hook directly up. Um, but if not, we can talk a little bit. Oh, you do not? Oh. Well, then we probably need to talk a little bit about what kind of camera to get. Um, and then that's going to be a bit of a longer conversation, probably. But uh, we could chat about it on Discord if you want. Um, you know, it depends on if you're only going to use it for streaming. Um, versus are you going to use it for something else? You have an Omax, that's just the microscope camera that was that came with the actual like microscope. Yeah. Yeah, let's do it in Discord. Uh, let's see. Anaha says, I know nothing about diatoms. Uh, they're beautiful, but does it have anything to do with what's called diatomaceous earth? It has everything to do what's, with what's called diatomaceous earth. So diatomaceous earth is what scientists would refer to as diatomite. And that's just a rock that's been made entirely out of diatoms. And um, diatomaceous earth is just basically crushed diatomite. So um, it's a rock that has, I think the, the qualification is it has to have at least 90% of the mass be diatom skeletons. Um, is it brittle? It can be. Um, more typically, the rock itself, diatomite, the rock, is, um, it looks like chalk, basically, except for it's not calcareous, it's made out of silica, and it's extremely lightweight because the diatoms are fluffy, uh, they're lacy organisms, and um, I have some diatomite, I could probably just bring it in, uh, that's still in the rock form, and um, behind me in this stack of uh, SEM stubs, there's a bunch of 10 million year old uh, diatomaceous earth or diatomite um, that we looked at from uh, Paleo Lake, Idaho. So that's a, a regular uh, uh, part of my research. So people can eat diatomaceous earth. I don't think it actually provides any health benefits, but, um, but more commonly people use it for uh, sprinkling it in their garden around plants or on their sidewalks to get rid of insects because the broken diatom valves actually are composed of a bunch of really little sharp edges and they create cuts for microscopic organisms and in particular they're very difficult for um, uh, insects that crawl across it will, will basically get damaged by it so they won't walk through it and um, and also uh, like things like slugs and snails don't like crawling across it either. So it's like usually used for keeping pests out. Um, we have some in my home that we use to sprinkle on ants nests basically that are too close to the house. So um, it's, uh, I don't think that actually provides any health benefits in the sense that it's just silica. 
it's just opal and silica and um, your body doesn't need any opal and silica <laughs> for anything that I can think of um, but it's used in filters it's used in pool filters and beer filters and wine filters uh, it's used in toothpaste as um, and tooth powder as studio mentioned and um, in the old days the old forms of uh, dynamite used uh, diatoms as a stabilizing component to keep the uh, the glycerin from basically interacting with itself so the um, the dynamite stick is basically all diatoms and then glycerin poured into the spaces between it with a blasting cap that causes the material to actually then um, interact with it so yeah it's used as an abrasive in cleaning products it's used as um, uh, there's a whole bunch of possible uses for it, but I wouldn't eat it. Uh, I don't think that is helpful. <laughs> um, can I provide a perspective in micrometers? So there's a scale bar at the bottom. That little funny shaped U next to the 20 um, in the bottom of the screen here. Uh, hang on a second. I'm just going to add the uh, the name for this one. Um, down here at the bottom is a little scale bar, and this scale bar is showing you what is 20 microns, or 20 micrometers. And so uh, there's 1,000 micrometers in a millimeter, and so the smallest tick on a ruler is a millimeter, like on a metric uh, ruler is a millimeter, and 1,000 of those uh, are... Um, micrometers. There's 1,000 micrometers in a millimeter. Um, and so the, the field of view on this diatom um, from, from corner to corner on this stage is, uh, sorry, from edge to edge on this stage in either direction because it's a square, is 97 micrometers. And down here it tells you what the magnification that we're looking at it is. This is 3,560 uh, times. So around 4,000 times magnification, or 3,500 times magnification. So um, a typical light microscope, if you just put it on the highest setting for any typical light microscope um, that doesn't have special eyepieces, is typically 1,000 times. So that's sort of where they max out. Actually, they max out a little bit less than that, but um, they magnify the image using that. And um, so this is basically three and a half times more powerful than the highest setting on a typical light microscope. And um, that's just uh, from that view, we could, of course, get crazy close. There's no, um, there's nothing stopping me from zooming in um, other than my interest in zooming in. So if you wanted to look at all the crazy little holes on these things a little bit closer, uh, we could definitely do that. Right now we're at um, 15,000 times. And uh, if you wanted to just keep zooming in, as I mentioned, we don't really have anything that says no, you can't do that. Uh, on an SEM, you just can keep zooming in, looking at the detail, and then uh, the trick becomes getting the focus to basically still work at that, whatever magnification you get it at. Um, at some point, it becomes very difficult to focus. We're not there at, um, at 70,000 times, which is where we are right now. I can easily still focus this image. Um, and you can see in this little window that um, there's actually a lot of substructure associated with each one of these little holes. They actually have little holes in them. So if you were wondering, like, uh, you know, like, what's that actual structure look like? It's a series of these sort of bigger holes with little tiny holes in the pore coverings that are on them. Um, and we could zoom in if you wanted to uh, on one of these, just one of these little um, areoli just to look at it. So now we're just inside one of these little holes basically, or just at the outside edge of one of them. Um, and you can see the issue is basically that at some point it becomes a little bit more challenging to focus. And there's a narrow window for what will be in focus, basically. Um, so we can do it. 
Um, this particular image where we are right now is 240,000 times magnification. So basically 240 times um, what you can do with a typical light microscope. Um, so 240,000 times, sorry, 240,000 times magnification. And we can see stuff. Um, it just starts to get difficult. And one of the things we need to do if we want to improve that is change our beam intensity. So we could lower the beam intensity to three, which makes the size of the beam a little bit smaller, which actually lets us see a little bit more of that detail. But the problem is that now the image is darker because not as much information is coming back to the sensor. And so it becomes a balancing act between how much information can we get and, um, and um, how bright the image is versus um, how in focus the image is. So, um, you know, if we were looking at the ultra structure of this diatom in particular, and we were trying to figure out, like, how is it composed, we could theoretically come and see these little tiny holes inside the bigger holes um, that are inside that larger network of um, organisms. But uh, at some point, we're going to reach the limit of what we can focus, what we can easily focus. So we were zoomed in just now. Let's see if I come out here and slow the beam down. We were just inside one of these little tiny uh, holes, looking at the little holes that are within those. Um, but you can see zoomed Good out news, to everyone. where we were when we took that picture. The, even the little parts that we were, you know, staring into are just little tiny holes, right? So everything is basically in this sort of nested, kind of fractal-like nature um, for the materials. And it's important that um, that mostly that I'm, um, our images are aimed towards what am I trying to capture. So like sometimes we may be looking at some little tiny microscopic detail and then um, that would be very useful to be in that close. Sometimes we just want to see the overlying sort of bigger superstructure. It's a little um, Asteromphalus for people who are um, uh, followers. There's a little Asteromphalus astro, astro, uh, emote now. So boop, right there. If you're a follower, you can spam those into the channel and then they should uh, show up on the bigger screen somewhere. Um, that's the same diatom right there that, that uh, we're looking at on the SCM. It's a drawing of one. Uh, I rendered that. Uh, that's my own hand drawing of one that I colored. So I started from the SEM and then I just basically drew uh, this diatom. Um, a lot of what I do for uh, those images that are below us, uh, that are below me in the in the stream, those are our mostly images that I colorize. So if you're wondering why aren't these in those sort of spectacular pretty colors, it's because they start off black and white and then I colorize them. So it's a little bit of my artwork you're seeing down there. And um, with various levels of contribution from the type of software that I'm using typically. Um, so we can get a picture of one of these if you'd like. This one's pretty clean. And um, I could just take a little three minute photo of that. It's not actually a photograph because it's not all at the same time, but there you go. All right, and then I can kind of come back. Eating it sounds dangerous. Yeah, I, I, you're not gonna get hurt from it, but you're not gonna get helped from it either. So, um, you know, that's the way I would view diatomaceous earth. Uh, it's just a non-entity. It'll pass through you, basically. So <laughs> that's how diatoms will attack. Uh, they could attack that way, I guess. People might think it will get rid of parasites, but I doubt that it would actually do anything to parasites, Anna. I, I don't think that that's uh, likely. I guess it's possible, but I doubt it. So not your average eye can see it. No eyes can see uh, what we're looking at. Um, they would look like little tiny pieces of 
glitter in the light. Um, they're dust-sized particles. So you, you could see a thing um, as a speck uh, for diatoms, but you aren't going to be able to see any of the details that we're talking about in this sort of uh, images. So, right cabins, first time chat. I remember going on a field trip to a wastewater treatment plant and they had one of these microscopes. In a wastewater treatment plant? What would they be using it for there uh, is a little beyond me, but um, it's possible. Uh, it's just firing new electrons to focus that particular area. Yes. Uh, so to answer that question, Driz, I actually have a little, I can show you a little, I can do a little like, here's what happens inside the SEM. Uh, I think you can see that now. Here's a little example. This at the top of the SEM is an electron gun. And then um, uh, the ring at anodes is basically a charged ring to pull the electrons out of the electron gun part and accelerate them down towards the sample. And then the magnets are used like lenses are used in a typical light microscope. And then um, that's focused down onto the specimen. In this case, that specimen is an ant. Uh, in the image. And then electrons are knocked out of the specimen at the point where the beam is, and that information goes to the secondary detector. And um, so if the face or the surface of that specimen is pointed towards the sensor, then more of those electrons actually reach the sensor, and the sensor actually is um, amplifying that by the more pieces of electrons that hit it, the brighter that image will appear at that spot. So um, it gauges how bright that is. And so basically it's reconstructing uh, topographic information about the surface of whatever that is. So like a flashlight, it's brighter on the side that the flashlight um, is reflecting towards your eye, right? So um, the more electrons that reach the sensor, the brighter that part is. And then it just moves along the stage, scanning it bit by bit. And the brightest spots are where most of the electrons are getting back to the sensor, um, or where most of the electrons occur. And the darker areas are areas that are basically recessed or where the light can't, not light, electrons can actually um, be captured from it. So a dark spot is an area where there's not a lot of electrons returning to the sensor. And a bright spot is an area where a lot of electrons are reaching the sensor. That's basically it. Um, and then it scans very quickly across that surface and um, pixel by pixel basically tells us what that information is at each site, which why it looks like it's downloading uh, images, but it's not actually downloading them. It's, uh, it's drawing it, scanning it as it goes. And then you can see here it's doing that now. If I make the beam go a little bit faster, you'll see that line move faster, but you'll see that the image becomes lower resolution because it can't get as much information from each point. It's spreading out the beam a little bit farther, and so it's not getting quite as much information. And I can make it go even slower or even faster. Now it looks like a TV, so we can move around. If I try to move around with it at a high speed, what happens is this, right? Uh, I can't get it to give me enough information quickly enough because the scanning slow. So I can actually see what's going on if I make it a little bit, uh, scan a little bit faster across that surface. And so I have sort of controls that allow me to determine like what we can see, how easily we can see it. And then I just make those changes while nobody's watching, like, because I know what I'm, I know how to control the instrument. But um, a lot of it's done without, uh, I don't even think about what I'm doing anymore. So I don't really document like, now I'm going to change the speed. I just change it because uh, I need to, basically. So I like to sort of uh, uh, compare it to driving a car. At first, it seems like an impossible task, and then because there's all these things you have to do at the same time, but um, and then the controls basically just become sort of second nature to to you after a while, and. Um, and you don't think about what you're doing, you just do them. Like, oh, I need it to be faster, I need it to be slower, I need to focus. So you just end up basically making the adjustments you need to make intuitively, um, hopefully, because otherwise it would be very challenging to, um, 
to operate it. If you had to constantly stop and think, like, what do I need to do next? Um, is that really what I think that is? Is it outlined for Hydrocera? I think that's an outline for a diatom. That's just the girdle band of Hydrocera or Hydrocera. Never seen one of those before. You see, it's like a triangle with another triangle, but the vowel face is missing. Never seen a Hydrocera. But that is what they should look like in. Uh, in theory, that means somewhere in these samples are some hydrocera. They may not be very well preserved. Well, that's got a lot of stuff on it. I think it's just Thalassiosira again. Although it looks like maybe there's two room of Portula. Okay, uh, we've just been tooling around in um, in these uh, marine samples for a while, and uh, it's another silica flagellate. I think somebody was asking me for one. It's a little silica flagellate. That's not a diatom. It's a sort of animal that lives in the ocean. Um, and they're usually either like diamond shapes or pentagram shapes Good or news, whatever everyone. with these sort of bridge structures between the edges and spines coming out. That's like a characteristic for silica flagellates. Um, that's just the basically internal skeleton of that organism. Ooh, it's an external view of that same Asteromphalus that we were looking at, but this one's highly dissolved. This is what they look like from the outside. It's not a very, it's not in very good shape. I haven't really found any dinoflagellates, so that part of the quest for today is a bit of a bust, but I feel like we've seen a lot of cool stuff in these samples. Um, some of them are ones that we've seen before, but that's okay. Uh, there's some really cool uh, SEM Im images that have come out of it. And um, there's probably more to see in here. There's one of these. A square-shaped diatom, a cruciform diatom. Good news, everyone! We kept seeing these, but they were all full of clay. But this one's not full of clay. And I don't know what the genus for this one is. Maybe if Anna is still here, she does. We kept seeing this and then being like, I don't know what that is. Looks like it has a pseudo, a very heavy pseudo septa. And you can see a little bit of the vowel face, but this is an internal view. Let's see, I want it to be about 190 maybe? So kind of get it corner to corner. Actually needs to go up 200. Let's see. Just gonna work on the focus a little bit and then we'll take a picture of this weird little guy. and see what people have been chatting about. So 
can see what happens when I slow the beam down. You can start to see all the detail. This stuff in here is clay. It's not part of the skeleton. And these are silt-sized particles. Um, probably just got carried into the material and because it landed um, face down. Basically, we can see the inside of the diatom and then these particles probably landed inside of it once it uh, landed on the stub. go back a little bit uh, it looks a little bit like a sand dollar yeah that's true uh, shiner Sean that's pretty much what everybody says when they see it so when it's alive how do they move uh, Astromphilus is plankton so it just floats so uh, all of the art is just art diatoms are made out of silica the opal and silica so basically they're glass um, and so they don't have a color in terms of their skeleton, which is the part that we see. But diatoms in real life are typically sort of um, filled with chloroplasts that are sort of an orangey brown or golden brown color. So. Yeah, so about the coloring, I made a little coloring contest. Boom. There's some information about it. If you're interested in winning uh, a gift certificate, you gotta enter the contest to win. But I do talk about how I colorize the image in a stream that, that's linked down there. And um, you have to join the Discord probably to get access to the, uh, the uh, contest. But other than that, um, all, all people are welcome to submit something. And the prize right now is set at $20 as a gift certificate for Redbubble. You can spend it on whatever you want on Redbubble. Um, and then we'll probably give a runner-up prize as well. So, and I'm not in the contest, you're not competing with me, you're competing with the community, so. You do some yard work and there's a break in the rain. Okay, we'll see you later, studio. You have samples full of hydrocera? I've never seen it. I've never seen it in real life anyway. Uh, <laughs> call this one Star, Tom. It's a interesting sort of two triangle shape shapes stacked on top of each other basically so pretty cool um yeah uh now that's a microscope yeah it's a microscope super powerful one but uh we use a microscope in here um one of the problems with the scanning electron microscopes is well problems uh, is that people want to see things wiggle around and uh, everything in the scanning electron microscope is dead. So we're just looking at their skeletons. And um, even when we have organisms that were alive, uh, they usually don't look that good when you put them in the scanning electron microscope relative to something you might see on like this Vic Plankton stream where they're crawling around or, or swimming around. No thoughts on what the square guy is. Square thing. Not sure. Unknown square thing. It's a diatom, but which diatom? I don't know. This is Pleurocyra, Pleurosigma, right here. And this big guy right down here is an Ismia. And then there's a really interesting little cosinodiscus right here. This really strong hexagonal structure on the valve face. Let's take a look at this isthmia. Hey, Maori Sowery. Um, one of the first streams that I did, we were looking at where we were looking at um, marine diatoms. We looked at one of these isthmia. Good news, everyone. And I was talking about how. These little um, areoli, the openings on ismia, are about two to three microns in diameter. Like we can zoom in and just look at one of those, uh, in fact, and look at the, uh, the structure of the areoli for these and the covering that goes over them, um, because that is something that we can uh, we can zoom into. It's not that. 
that uh, small. So this one is about three microns across, maybe a little bit larger. And um, the funny thing is there are diatoms that are uh, in total only three to four microns in, uh, in size. And I have some of those basically, not in these samples, but we could probably take a look at some of them. And so another whole diatom basically could be the size of the opening on this diatom. It's a monstrous diatom in terms of size, right? Uh, so each one of those could be basically, a, one of the smallest diatoms would be able to fit through that hole or would essentially be that entire hole on this diatom. And each one of those diatoms are just covered with all kinds of these holes that are basically the size of another diatom. So kind of cool uh, to think about, you know, like it would be comparable to uh, if we were thinking about larger organisms like a human, right? This is like a pore on the surface of this thing's skin and a whole nother human would be able to fit through the pore on that uh, and still be in the same group of organisms, which would be crazy, right? Wouldn't be the same as a human being, but roughly like that where you have an opening, and the opening is basically big enough on this thing that it is the size, the pore is the size of an entire another organism in that group. So, kind of cool. We'll just take a quick picture of this uh, surface of this isthmia, where we can see the pores. Oh, Sarah, you've been giving out gift subs? Sneaky, sneaky person. Um, I just have to comment. I've been sure it's been said before. There are people watching hot tub streams when amazing content like this exists. <laughs> um, people watch what they want to watch. Um, you know, I, I can't force people to like science or to be interested in art or to like good music or whatever. Um, if they want to watch, uh, you know, the wiggly bits on people's bodies, they can. I'm not going to fight with them about that they probably wouldn't appreciate what we're looking at, um, you know. But I do appreciate that comment, um, which is that, you know, we'd like to provide a science option for people and, um, and have that Good be news, something everyone. that people who are interested could actually get a chance to, um, to see things. Oh, that's an isthmia below us right now, and that's an isthmia over there on the, well, it's gone now. We had one on, on both of the, I can't figure out which way is which because everything's backwards for me, but, um, but thanks for that comment, Shiner. And uh, thank you for gifting a subscription to them. Um, do they just come out blurry? I don't know what that question is uh, asking me about, but now you have uh, the ability to spam the channel with all of these emotes. Um, well, I guess you don't have the top tier ones, but um, I often hear people tell me that we have some of the best uh, emotes on, on Twitch, and I've added some new ones recently because of the follower uh, thing, so here's a whole bunch of those. Um, and... Uh, How wide is this across? Uh, the image current field of view is 23 microns across, I think. So uh, it would take, let's see, five of those would be 100. And so uh, 50 of those would take up uh, of our current field of views to get into a millimeter. We'd need 50 of those. Uh, Let's see, <laughs> wiggly bits. Uh, I've got 589, 598 of 600 valves in my transect ended. Now I have to start a new transect. Can't you just count two valves into the transect and then stop? Do you always count whole transects, uh, Anna? Or just count one field of view and then stop? Um, gotta support Mallory, yeah. Oh, all of the, oh. Hello, mind of a snail. We have a uh, have a little snail command for you here. Oop. 
uh, I don't know why we don't have like a little thing that pops up when, when people say the word snail. Uh, I guess I didn't get it. I need to get the like the emote and make it so that it floats around on the screen like everybody else's. It'll be done. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Should check out Mind of a Snail. They stream on Sunday nights. They do music and. Um, puppeteering, I guess you'd call it, uh, like shadow puppets, and um, easily one of the funnest things that you could uh, hang out um, with on a Sunday night on Twitch. So, and I'm usually there, uh, occasionally I can't either because I'm busy with work or uh, something comes up with my family, or I don't know, it's Halloween, uh, but you should... Uh, should definitely check out Mind of a Snail. They've been around on our stream since the very beginning, and we've been following Mind of a Snail since the very beginning of their stream as well. So it's a super fun stream. And sometimes they have guests. I know Pacific Plankton and OpenSet have both port portaled in um, to, to their streams and uh, did some of their content while they did sort of puppeteering over top of it. And... Um, uh, Oh, you'd have me as a guest sometime? Well, that would be nice. Um, and they've got some of my artwork uh, that they use as, uh, occasionally they use diatom puppets. So just saying, if you wanted to like, you know, check them out, uh, especially if I'm gonna be on there, you know. Uh, I don't know if we'd be able to do SEM streams at Sunday night at midnight uh, or 10 o'clock or whenever it is, but, um, Probably could come in from the light microscope side. I got one of those at home that will work just fine. This Mia. That's what we're looking at currently. Let's zoom out. So we were just looking at the little pores on the surface of this Ismia. And let's see what else we can find. Um to look at. It's almost three, and I feel like I've been streaming for almost three hours at that point, which is kind of a lot for me. I haven't eaten lunch as usual, and uh, probably will start getting on with my day by around three or 3.30. Um, I have some pending work that needs to get done, of course. It's hard being a professor. Uh, it's time-consuming and uh, it's kind of a luxury to be able to come spend um, three hours or four hours or even two hours uh, hanging out with people and talking about diatoms and sort of explaining what it is that uh, that I specialize in um, so this has been great uh, it's been great fun for me Not totally ending yet, but we probably got one more picture in us before we have to start start thinking about a, an escape route. Um, just thought I would look around a little bit, see if we can find anything in these samples that are um, completely new, that we haven't already spent a little bit of time looking at. Um, I might actually jump over to, I've got one more sample of this stuff, and I have some of uh, material from June Lake that is on here as well that we could look at. Let's look at this other sample real quick, see what's there, if anything. I haven't looked at these samples at all yet. There's a little Actinopticus, an external view of one. Looks like a little radiation sign, basically. It's radioactive. Uh, that's actually how the diatom community responds to that one as well. They're like, oh, it's the radioaction, radioactive diatom. It's not actually radioactive, but that is a sim symbol. Uh, this is Campliodiscus right here, this broken thing. Part of it's coming out the screen at us. 
and I think that's a Mitzia. What is this guy? Oh, Valesia Syra. It's got a little fracture in it. All right, well, hopefully I've convinced some more people to enter the coloring contest. At a minimum, I would like to see, we've got one entry so far. So uh, the competition may not want you to enter um, but I feel like it would be good to, uh, to have several people and then I'm probably going to run it uh, again next uh, month with a different uh, concept for it but um, I guess only if we have enough contestants so if you're not um, aware of the coloring contest if you just came in relatively recently um, there's a link on the Discord uh, to in the art section to um, a image. The image that's for the coloring contest is actually going to be uh, this image, which is a close-up image of a diatom. You could print it out and color it with crayons or colored pencils and then submit the picture of that to me, or you could use Photoshop or GIMP or... Uh, any of the tools that I talk about in the, um, uh, yes, there's a coloring contest. There's the information for it. If you want to watch the video on how I do the coloring of diatoms, um, I did a whole stream on it. I talked about all the different techniques that I use. And there's a prize, a $20 gift certificate from Redbubble um, is one of them. And then we might have a secondary prize if I have enough entrance. Um, there's no cost to enter other than your time and um, it will be at least partially judged by my daughter and if there's a lot of entries like you know 10 or more uh, we might do one stream where i have people in the channel kind of uh, vote on them to get them down to the top three and then probably my daughter and i will um, make decision from that uh, as to which are the winners but you can color them however you like and, uh, you know, probably the more imaginative, the better. Uh, you can, can uh, like I said, just use crayons if you want, um, if that's your, your preferred coloring. Um, you can color them using uh, drawing tools, uh, digital drawing tools, if you'd like. It's, the image, I think, is just a, a PNG um, or a JPEG. So you should be able to colorize it however you'd like. And then, um, and then there's prizes. So it's a way for me to give some money back to the community. And um, it'll come out of my pocket, not out of the money that, uh, that people subscribe with. But, um, and also to, uh, I think, uh, share the experience of colorizing diatom images and I'm hoping to make it, like I said, it's sort of a regular thing. I don't know if it'll be every month or maybe close to every month. We'll see. I've got a lot of diatom images that could be colored. Um, and it won't necessarily always be diatoms, I suppose. So, um, but it seemed like a fun thing to do. And, um, and so I'm hoping to get some people that are interested in doing it uh, so that we can take a look at uh, how other people uh, imagine things for um, science art so no pressure uh, you know however you feel comfortable doing it I think you could probably even use PowerPoint to colorize them if you tried um, anyway whatever you wanted Nothing in here is like just yelling out to me. We gotta have a picture of that. So maybe I'll just jump over to the June Lake sedimentary sample. I know that um, Studio Cornix uh, sent me these materials. So, and we spent a little bit of time looking through them last stream, which was last Wednesday. Um, I should also point out that normally we stream on Wednesdays and 
um, recently it's been Wednesdays and Saturdays. So my next stream would normally be Saturday. However, um, this coming Saturday, I'm going to be uh, streaming for the artist Back Alley, which is a group of um, artists on Twitch that uh, do a raid train. They go from one channel to the next to the next. And, um, and we uh, stream art for like an hour and then they go to the next channel and um, and just keep working their way through a whole list of artists and um, my daughter is uh, sometimes streams with me drawing stuff for people so she draws whatever people request uh, on procreate using her ipad and um, so we're going to we entered her into the um, the ray train and uh so we're gonna have her be part of the artist community this saturday and it's right during the time i might normally stream that there was an opening so um we'll probably just do that and there won't be a normal scm stream this week on the weekend unfortunately i think it's like the third weekend in a row where we couldn't do it because so last weekend i had a field trip um and the weekend before that we went to see dune so uh it seems like I'm only streaming from the SEM once a month, uh, I mean once a week, that's why uh, we just had some circumstances recently, but uh, we should be back on the regular schedule after that, and um, the schedule for me for the semester is actually starting to wind down a little, um, while things are more challenging for students towards the end of the semester, they actually get a lot easier for professors, so... Um, I just have to grade stuff, which is like my least favorite part, but that's basically um, the way things sort of end up for us is that it gets a little bit easier as the semester goes along because people have to write papers and do projects and stuff like that. So there's a lot less um, things that I need to be directly involved in. This is a, I think this is a Holocosira colony and this one is some sort of weird pinularia, which I haven't seen before in these samples. Um, so I was trying to find an external view of it. It might take a while. Um, this is samples. So we moved into freshwater systems. These are samples from June Lake. Um, and I've worked a lot in June Lake, so uh, they're materials that I'm a lot more familiar with. But I just wanted to maybe grab one photo from this and then uh, we'll call it a day, maybe. So I can eat some lunch before it becomes dinner time. And um, hopefully we can find something that looks kind of cool to image. This diatom over here, right here, is the same one as the new uh, red diatom that's in the channel that's Stephanodiscus caruscus in the emotes. And um, this diatom over here is actually Stephanodiscus nigeri, I think. Oh no, it's too small for nigeri. That might also be caruscus. I thought I saw a big one over here somewhere. I have seen some nigeri in these samples before. And then there's also some lindavia. This is Lindavia Intermedia. Is it stuff that's just dissolved? In a lot of the sediment samples, there's some dissolution as a result of um, higher pH in the water, typically. So in um, systems that have a little bit higher pH, the diatoms will start to dissolve. That is uh, Pseudostar Syra Brevistraida, I believe. It's another Pinularia, internal view. It's a big Stephanie, uh, Sororella, an external view. everyone. 
and other stuff. You can see this one is a little bit corroded. This is Coruscus again. See there's no valve face photoportula whatsoever on it. Um, that's a characteristic for Stephanodiscus Coruscus. Separates it from many other Stephanodiscus diatoms that are belonging to this sort of similar group. It's another one of those big pinularias. An internal view again. Oops, what was that? Well, let's go up here and look at this. Little round guy. And then we can take a look at that one. It's another Stephanodiscus. Stephanodiscus have a stri that start at the margin and go all the way to the middle. They don't have any sort of a chamber. They have uh, striated processes that make a ring around the outside edge with a, um, a rim of portula that's also in that ring or close to it. And on the outside, they have a spine associated with each one of the striated processes. It's like a characteristic pattern for that group, for the genus. Looks like maybe it's an internal view of Anumastus. It's got a little bit of clay covering the middle. Sorry, I will get back to chat here in a second. I just kind of need to find something for us to image first. Some look like some more anumastus, which is quite common in these samples. This is a star anise. You can see the star structure here in the middle. Basically, it doesn't have any stri in the midsection of the diatom. It's not a particularly clean sample, though. There's a lot of chunky, clay-covered stuff in it and dissolved diatoms. Let's hop over to two and see if it's any better. Good news, everyone! a lot of sponge spicules in it too. All these little things that are here are sponge spicules. Internal view of a Stephanodiscus and an external view. This is Lindavia costii. It's again a little dissolved. everything in the mud samples uh, from the sedimentary samples are just a little too dissolved to get like a really cool image from maybe just these look like they got a little too much junk on them on the inside 
and those ones look like they're just a little too dissolved. This one looks like it's in okay shape. All right, let's, let's see. Rotate it. Rotate it a little bit out of our field of view. Angle looks pretty good. Okay. It looks like everything's in focus. This is another Animastus, I believe. Or Mastogloia, maybe. No, I think it's Animastus. And let's see, we're going to lower that down to five. We're going to change the speed to 8. We'll do a brightness contrast. And then we'll come back here and see what's going on. Good Sorry, news, it was everyone. a long period where I was just kind of digging around and stuff. I didn't get a chance to interact with chat very much. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, if you don't mind asking... Where are you? U.S. Northern California. I'm in U.S. I'm in Indiana. Good news, everyone. Indiana State University is my university. I'm a professor there. So, uh, yeah. Uh, please enter. Yeah. Shadowfax wants some competition. So, uh, this is so fun. You could watch or explore this for hours. Well, um, usually Wednesdays, this is what we do, starting around noon-ish, ish and um, sometimes starting a little bit later and going a little bit later. But I feel like um, you can catch us every week on Wednesday for sure. And then I like to try to also, as I said, get in on the Saturday and do it as well. Uh, sometimes on Monday too, um, if I have a particularly light week or if I'm working with students. Um, so you can definitely catch our stream and we're on regularly. We don't always look at diatoms, but a lot of times we do. Um, let's see. Oh, we got raided while I was busy chatting and I didn't even see it. I'm sorry, Teach Astronomy. Thank you for raiding and for bringing your viewers into the channel. And I see Bill Nash came with you. Hello, Bill. Um, let's see. I just need to catch up with chat a little bit. Uh, Headshot Specialist, hello. Um, let's see. What are you saying, Xavier? Uh, I should turn them into a coloring book. I actually am working on something like that. We'll see. Um, can we do a party hat dinoflagellate one month? We can. Uh, for sure, Sarah. Let me know and I'll, uh, I'll work on it. Um, thanks for introducing to diatoms. No problem. Is there a way to detect what color things should be realistically? Well, these are diatoms, so they realistically don't have color on the skeleton. They're, they're glass basically so you can see through their skeleton um, but they sometimes have what's called physical light um, or basically light created by optical refraction um, which makes them look all kinds of colors so I don't mind putting whatever color we want onto them um, because that's not actually what I'm aiming to do but um, <laughs> um, it's fun that she actually gets to interact with them, yeah. Uh, what's my doctorate in? I have a doctorate in geology with um, a specialization in diatoms, basically. So um, I was trained in undergrad as a geologist, in my master's program as a geologist, and in my PhD is basically purely diatoms, but the degree is geology with the specialization in geosciences. Um, I am not a biologist, but uh, diatoms 
Um, and my skill set is actually as a paleoecologist require me to sort of have an understanding of paleoclimatology, biology, ecology, um, geology, sedimentology in particular, and uh, I'm also a limnologist. So um, when people ask me what I do, I just say science. Uh, and then if they really seem to pressure me about it, I start to talk about, um, I study diatoms for the most part. Um, but my research is usually paleoclimate focused or reconstructing paleo environments using diatoms as a tool. I sometimes also study things like fire history, uh, drought history, um, using diatoms or using other proxies that are found in aquatic systems, um, particularly using lake sediments. I also do taxonomy. Um, I've described species and I have a genus that I've also described uh, in diatoms. So I have a very broad range of, um, of tool sets. So um, do you save these into large zoomable images. I do have a large database of images um, and um, you can get access to them either through the Redbubble site if you want to buy them or um, if there's something that you wanted in particular just come on to Discord. A lot of times I take the pictures from uh, the streams and I post them after I colorize them into Discord. So. Um, Thanks again for rating Teach Astronomy. I finally just caught up to your, uh, to your raid in the chat and for the viewers that came in. And um, you've been busy, you spent the weekend repairing a couple of observatories, getting them back into shape for remote use, heading into the galaxy season. Well, that sounds amazing. I think I, have like a, I think I have like a Nash command in here. Is that true? Look at that, I do. Um, thanks for uh, bringing some people with you, uh, Bill and uh, check out those new follower emotes that we have. Um, waiting for clear skies, that's usually the opposite of what I'm hoping for. I'm usually looking for storms. Um, my medium format AstroCam isn't cooperating. Well, that sucks. Um, we we're talking about astronomy news today. Oh, that's cool. Um, that's a cool topic. I'm glad you guys came here, even though we don't really talk about astronomy in the channel. I'm a photographer. I sometimes do astrophotography, night photography. I sometimes stream uh, images of the moon. Um, sometimes I stream a little bit of the astrophotography. Uh, we've done that before. Um, it's a little bit more challenging getting internet access in the places where I might need to do that. Um, and then I also sometimes just do like uh, bird streams where I do bird photography um, from birds that are running around. And then uh, sometimes I just do photo editing streams as well. So um, let's see. Uh, you're in California right now. Oh, uh, let's see. It's sort of in geology. Uh, it's sort of a combination. It's interdisciplinary, uh, Shiner, to get to your question. Um, Good question, frickin', what does frickin' say? What color, what is the color on a molecular level? Well, it's silica, so, I mean, uh, loaded, did, 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 can I read minds? Not that I know of. Um, let's see. I'm trying to read through. I'm trying to get to all the questions. Adjacent to diatom, how's the field of nanotech these days? Is there much crossover in your studies with organisms? with designing micro machines. There are people who talk about the nanotechnology of diatoms quite a bit. Um, and uh, I interact with some of them. Uh, sometimes they come to the stream to chat with me about um, how diatoms can be used in nanotechnology. So, hey, Devil and Mrs. J, hello. Um, just came in right at the end, M-R-S-J. Um, Oh, what is color? Yeah, well, I mean, we're not on the molecular level here, but we're, you know, closer than normal to that, I guess. Um, all right, you'll be back. Have a great day. Thank you. Uh, thanks also for hanging out and asking questions. So, um, are diatoms being leveraged industrial? I don't think so, but I guess it's possible. 
Um, okay, so uh, I wanted to end the stream uh, on this image, and uh, we've been going for like three hours and 15 minutes or something like that, which is, you know, sort of at the limit of how much time I can spend. And um, one thing that I like to do is to stream into uh, musician channels or art channels. And um, I have uh, friends who are in all of those that stream. And um, so right now, my friend Hannah um, Rebecca is streaming. And um, I particularly like to rate her when she's on because um, she wrote a whole song about diatoms and about the stream in particular, and she'll sing them if we request it. So it's a fun stream for us to raid into because then she'll sing diatom song. Um, and I've never had anybody else write a whole song about me that I know of. So uh, it's a fun place for me to go raid. And I like to just hang out with Hannah. She sings mostly um, sort of indie band uh, music and um, she has a wide range of stuff that she will play for us. Um, she doesn't do like live learns frequently, but she does do, um, she has a, a pretty long uh, potential list of songs. So I think we'll go raid Hannah. Um, uh, what determines wavelength? I mean, the wavelength is what determines the color. The wavelength is about um, how it interacts with the material largely. Um, those are more like physics questions, but um, kind of outside of the realm of what I study. In terms of how we perceive it, it's about how, you know, light enters the, the eye. It's not really a molecular level sort of uh, component. Okay. Um, oh, Dr. Young's lab is a good place to, uh, to check out. He might be able to answer those questions for you. I don't think I actually have a... Um, have a command for him yet. Oh, it's fine. You can ask questions. It's just like, if you start asking really detailed questions, I probably can't answer them. So, and I don't mind uh, not being able to answer some things. So um, let's go give Hannah, Rebecca, Rebecca, I have to spell it correctly, Hannah Arrayed. And I want to say thank you. We've had a ton of people here in the stream today. We've got a bunch of follows. Um, uh, I'm going to try to read through some of them. We got rated by Teach Astronomy, and we had a bunch of gift subs. We got rated by Spider ID as well. So I want to say especially thank you for those two uh, streamers um, that came in. We had um, follows from Will RSQ, um, Pavel Germanica, and um, JP Ekru, and then uh, Dotagnon, Scrubterfuge. J.I. Likers, uh, Anaha36, Timber's 86SS. We had a gift sub from Rocket Sage uh, to Timber and a gift sub from Samsung to Rocket Sage. So reciprocal, reciprocal. Uh, hey, Maui, Sally. Knives, heck. Uh, Indi Indian Dinoflagellate followed. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, Reddit. Hey, Maui, Sally. Uh, White Star follower, Shiner Sean. Rye Cabins, uh, IP33. Uh, hey, Maui, Sally. We had a gift sub from uh, Sarah to, um, uh, to Shiner Sean. Savior Midnight, Delez, uh, Teach Astronomy, Mimi, Frog, Frickin. And then it looks like Sarah is going crazy giving out gift subs. Um, so thanks for that. Okay. 